So the Paris Agreement, yeah. <laughs> a bit of a disappointment on most fronts. And most of the discussion about it, of course, is about the um, targets. And uh, that's really important. It's centrally important. But I want to talk about something else that on the face of it might give us a little bit more ground for optimism about the direction that the global climate regime is taking. And actually, in terms of Tara's question earlier, I tend to use the phrase the global climate regime for the UNFCC and its related business, global climate governance for the broader multi-level um, activity that's going on in this area. It may not be perfect, but I think it captures something about how dynamic and how multifaceted this area is. And I'm going to look at something else that um, uh, uh, I suppose we were raising earlier, rebranding. It's not just firms who rebrand. I think arguably the global climate regime has attempted to rebrand itself in Paris by recasting itself at an official level, and this reflects something that had been going on for a long time within the regime, as something that is more akin to a stakeholder Right now, I really am beyond my. What do I need to do to get this to flip? It, I'll, okay. Right. So much the better. <laughs> Simple is better. So I think there's a, an attempt to re reframe our understanding of climate change, which I think is actually a good thing to do, and reframing it as a sustainability issue. When we started off dealing with climate change at real way back in the mists of time in 1992, the climate regime was essentially framed as a traditional international law issue. It was the business of states, largely, to a lesser extent business, and not much else. And it didn't really reflect the nature of climate change as a problem. Now, at that point, you can say, well, we didn't really have much of a handle on where the science was and how complex and how multidimensional, how cross-cutting, how untidy, how intractable climate change was going to be. So maybe that's fair enough. But it actually fairly quickly became apparent to the secretariat of the UNFCC that this was not a model that would work. The traditional order of business didn't really reflect what they needed to input into the regime. And they started, unofficially, to draw in a sort of stakeholder type approach, uh, drawing in what we would now say are major groups as originating in Agenda 21 at Rio, but spreading out a little bit beyond that now. But they did it in a very partial and I do mean that in both sense of the words, so not covering all major groups and favouring some major groups more than others. They did that in a very partial way. And that had been going on for quite a long time. We'll see exactly how long uh, shortly. But it took official um, form, I suppose, finally, in the Paris Agreement at long last, um, where the preamble to the agreement um, acknowledges multiple societal groups as being affected by climate change and their human rights, um, particularly indigenous peoples, local communities, migrants, children, persons with disabilities, and people in vulnerable situations. Um, where climate change is concerned, that's kind of everybody, at least according to Martha Feynman, who was here last week at this podium, at this time, <laughs> talking about this. But it did get the idea that in the preamble, climate change is recharacterized as a sustainability issue in that it's not just about the environment, it's certainly not just about the economy, it's also about people. And people on that level had been missing from the regime in most meaningful senses, very broadly speaking, up until that point. Um, that said, um, Preambles are slippery creatures in international law. It's actually quite surprising, as someone who's been looking at international law for mm, three and a bit decades, that the status of preambles is something that's actually relatively neglected in scholarship. There is no real definitive statement on their status. They can just be wishy-washy, lovely statements of pretty things that nobody can disagree with. 
they can be aids to interpretation as to what they are in the Paris Agreement, as yet we don't know. But the fact is that the change of direction is there in the preamble. More significantly, the change of direction is also expressed in Article 2 of the body text of the agreement. And I'll just extract the relevant phrase. And the aim of the convention, aside from our famous targets that we see um, elsewhere, is also stated as being to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change in the context of sustainable development. So it's in there. And notionally, that is really significant because notionally it brings to the fore the idea that as we understand as a society, where climate change is concerned, we're literally all in it together. Uh, it's not just the province of states. Everybody is a stakeholder in different guises in this process. However, the reality is that, as I say, this was, if you like, a, a rubber stamp almost on an, uh, a uh, development that had long predated Paris. And the reality is that stakeholder groups have vastly different experiences of participating in the climate governance regime. Some of them are knocking on an open door, some of them are not. And the photos, by the way, are completely random images to give you something to look at <laughs> and to remind me that I need to really get some hammerite onto the door handle at home uh, in this particular case. The gender constituency is a very good example of how some stakeholders are more equal than others, and that's what I'm going to look at with you today. So why is climate change a gendered issue? Well, in very practical terms, it has long been recognised that essentially, where climate change is concerned, it amplifies exacerbates and adds an extra dimension of complexity to existing gender inequalities. I'm not going to read out the slide. You have access to the slides. You can all read. And I hate it whenever I'm sitting there and someone reads out something. I think, don't they think I can read? Yes, of course you can. But essentially, what you're talking about here is, and the la that last sentence is, I suppose, really the important one about raising a gender issue in the climate context. It magnifies problems that we already know exist only too well. Now, if that weren't enough, so the, the reality of the situation that many women globally find themselves in as being among the most affected, particularly since they tend to be among the poorest groups in society, there are also very practical reasons for recognising climate change as a gendered issue. And the UN accepted this systemically for a very long time before the climate governance system did. So the Commission on Status of Women, CEDAW, quite early on, early 2000s, came out and said, yes, climate change is a gendered issue. Or you might say, fine, they're the gender groups, it's their job to do that. Well, yeah, but they weren't the only ones. The UN Development Programme, the IUCN, groups that have nothing on the face of it to do with gender, also recognised that climate change was a gendered issue. Partly prompted by the practical considerations of things that fell within their remit, partly as a matter of principle. If you are affected by something, you should have a voice. That lovely should, that moral claim that we're all so keen on as lawyers, but one that's very difficult to follow through in practice. The climate system's engagement, however, was awful. And it only changed because of focused campaigning by women's group. And yes, I did make the pussy hat. I also wore intellectuals and scared the first years, <laughs> which was very good fun. Um, focused campaigning. So women's groups in relation to uh, the climate system actually began to build consensus across the globe, networks and coalitions. They started to train uh, leaders, build capacity for women taking part in negotiating processes and to reach out to other civil society groups. One of the biggest things they've done, and I'm concentrating on this because this has now become central in the climate change regime, is that they promote gender mainstreaming. Now there are lots of definitions of gender, gender mainstreaming, but this ESCO one is probably the one that's used most often. And it essentially tells us that 
women's concerns and experiences need to be an integral part of the process, not just men's. That needs to permeate our governance system, so right from design through implementation to monitoring and evaluation, and that it needs to apply everywhere. Its ultimate goal, again, the last sentence is the one that's most important, is to achieve gender equality. And that's fabulous. How could you disagree with that? Particularly if you're a lawyer. Um, except it's very polite um, and it's based on essentially begging for something that we should already have. It's not as if gender equality is a new issue. It's not as if human rights are supposed to be unequal based on your gender. It's not as if that hasn't been written into the global human rights canon since we have it. And we're still having to play nicely to use cards like gender mainstream and go, it's in your best interest as a regime to grant us the equality that you say we already have. It's particularly frustrating. I should say, I think I'm sitting contemplating as to whether I am a masochist. I think I might be because mm. I specialise in climate change and gender equality and I spend my time swinging between being frustrated and angry or in some days for a bit of variation, angry and frustrated. <laughs> it really is like that. You just look at it and you think gender equality in the climate regime bears all the hallmarks of the climate regime itself. Too slow, not good enough. And there are real barriers to women's participation in the regime. A lot of them relate to the ability to make your case. Being there, though, is first and foremost the big, the big issue. And we'll see there we've made some progress in the global climate regime on being there, but not enough. Technical capacity, the ability to make your case, which most of the rest of these relate to, but also knowing that you have a case to make. That is something that is not necessarily um, a given in certain parts of the world. So awareness of your rights and being able to access those, being able to access law and policy information. And perhaps, and I'm going quickly because I've not got long, more than ever now, the presence or absence of a conducive environment to actually making that case. The gender rights rollback that we're seeing more generally in society is affecting climate change governance too, and we should be worried about it. And we should see the links. If we're talking about silos, none of these things take place or part in their own right. They're not isolated little incidences. So why was it important to make a case for, a con a cons or for constituency status? It gives you an official position in the regime machinery and it allows you intervention rights in the convention processes. It can't be more important. And when I tell you that Environment, business and industry NGOs were involved right from the drafting of the UNFCC. Local government and business from 1995, indigenous peoples from 2001, research and independent organisations from 2003 and trade unions by 2008. You might be somewhat shocked to find out, and this is why I researched this area because I know I was, that women didn't receive recognition as constituency until 2011. 2011, almost 20 years after we have a global climate regime, and you should be offended by that as lawyers, as people, not just as women, because it is actively offensive. So getting your status is important, and it was a long process. Women really started to try to get a seat at the table from 95 onwards, from the first conference of parties. That was failed. Things fell into abeyance. It wasn't until the WSSD um, that in 2002 that gender was on the agenda again because it was on the agenda at the WSSD and it began to reflect round the system. Mm -hmm. First Women's Caucus, 2005. Gender CC, a collaboration of international, truly global, so not just first world, but from everywhere. Women's groups, experts and activists got together to actually really take the campaign to get a constituency recognition forward. Got provisional recognition in 2009, 2011, they finally got formal recognition. And they've capitalised on it. It has brought gender to the fore in a way that it never was before in the regime. 
biggest developments, these are just some, but you can see year on year we're seeing developments now with respect to gender. So 2013, and this is probably the most decisive thing, the UNFCC started to disseminate information on the gender composition of its own bodies. And that made it embarrassingly clear how poor representation of women actually was. Shame is one of the biggest motivators we have in international governance regimes. Litigation at this level is not a possibility. But you can embarrass states and state actors by showing how little they do. At least that's what we always relied on until the current political... Uh, how would we describe it? Um, Omni shambles? <laughs> I'm trying to be polite. It makes me want to swear. Um, where shame may not be the motivator that it has been in the past for inactivity on areas where there are obvious needs for change and to live up to your legal obligations. Lima Work Programme brings it up. Paris Agreement, look great running up to it, not much in the actual agreement itself. Gender Action Plan, we're starting to see some real progress, a formal inclusion in the process. And look at this. This is what the UNFCC has been congratulating itself on. Brilliant, eh? 38% representation for women. That's equal. Not if you can count it isn't. But what you see every year is we're not making enough progress. We know we're not making enough progress. There aren't enough resources. We need to do more. We're still seeing that. We will see that in 2019 with the review of GAP. So finishing off, because it's obvious that we're not delivering on gender at the global regime, and this fits very neatly into what we've been talking about today. What about taking things from an activist perspective? What about taking things up? And there the climate change um, regime has some use as a lever for litigating where states are failing to act. And the Klima Signorinun case is particularly interesting as far as this goes. It's a case that was brought partly by Greenpeace, but actually headed by a consortium of older women um, who brought an action against the Swiss government, essentially saying that we are older women, the science shows that we suffer more because of the heat waves that are becoming more of a feature of our lives day to day with global heating. And your targets are not good enough, your mitigation is not good enough. So they requested the court to get the government to act. <sighs> there has been some optimism, or agenda of course, but the picture I have to say for climate change litigation at this point, because it's still fairly experimental, is at best mixed. And Klima Signorinen is not a case to get overly hopeful about uh, in terms of the court's analysis of it. So they presented a case based on strong science, which worked, of course, really well in Uganda. It was also a very strong feature in the Juliana litigation, for example, and in various other cases that I've looked at. So there was lots there in terms of the science. So they used epidemiology, they used the work of the IPPC, because obviously states have already rubber stamped that, and they used the Swiss government's own research that actually all showed that senior women are more likely to have their health adversely affected and more likely to die. I cannot be any more definitive than this because of climate change. And they needed to show that because domestic law required them to show that they weren't bringing an actio popularis, but that they were a most vulnerable group. They were more affected than anyone else. And essentially they argued that if we can't bring this case successfully, I'll quote, hardly anyone would have a most vulnerable status in connection with global warming. And that would essentially mean that acts and failures by states in fighting global warming, here they were using constitutional law in the ECHR, would hardly ever be actionable. And guess what? The court threw their case out. The court said, the impacts of climate change on people and animals and plants are of a general nature, even if not all are impacted equally. And adverse, the adverse effects vary among different population groups in terms of economic and health impacts. Well, 
Yes, but that doesn't mean older women don't suffer more. But they went on to say, having used a brief synopsis, even though they'd had 149 pages of detailed argument to look at, um, using a brief synopsis, this group has not shown that older women are particularly affected by climate change. So essentially, the detailed science had gender disaggregated data, which is rare enough in itself in climate change, and the court just went, meh. Okay, not quite, but I've only got <laughs> a couple of minutes, so <laughs> you get my point. They essentially rejected it. They also said, and this maybe is the final nail in the coffin, they also said that asking for government to improve its targets or to improve its mitigation wouldn't actually solve the problem. It wouldn't be decisive um, because a reduction in the general risk of danger can't be achieved directly through such actions. How else would it be achieved? It was a bizarre judgment. I've never read anything quite like it. It was actually illogical. Um, so climate change litigation using the science is not a golden bullet. The courts have to understand the science and they have to be prepared to actually be convinced by it. And in this case, the court did not want to make the government engage with this. And that's the problem that we've been talking about, about when will states do this? Even if we try to force them to do it, the answer is they may not. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And I thought, because I spend a lot of time being frustrated and angry, angry and frustrated, <laughs> occasionally depressed, that I'd finish with something a little bit more inspiring. We in this generation must come to terms with nature. And I think we're challenged, as mankind has never been challenged before, to prove our maturity and our mastery, not of nature, but of ourselves. That is what is required for a workable global climate governance. That is what is required for a workable global climate regime. Are we there? No. But you see the work of people like Naomi Klein, Rebecca Solnit, um, Kate Marvel. All of these activists, scientists, etc., are pointing out that we're not there yet, but we could be. And I told you I'd have a cat. I didn't pose her. She does this sort of thing all the time. I've got a picture of her in my Birkenstocks and in my shopping basket. But if a cat can see it, admittedly, she is an expert at hunting invisible things. <laughs> Uh, you'd think that we could. Um, so something cute to look at, at least to finish with. And David, I wouldn't recommend trying to skin her. She'd get you first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No chance. Uh, thank you. And I'm just about in time, yes? Just about. Thanks. Thanks for your patience. <laughs>